All right, everybody, we are live for another developer interview here on the Game Wisdom channel. As always, I am Josh Beiser, and we have another great cast lineup with, lined up tonight. My guest is the co-creator behind the game Dwarf Fortress, a game that has grown and has become kind of like almost the gold standard of simulation and to kind of like the, just the escapades of just insanity what can happen when dwarves try to build and things go horribly horribly wrong he is also he was also the editor on procedural generation and game design with tanya short and we're going to be talking about dwarf fortress proc gen and i'm sure a lot more tonight so please welcome from bay 12 games tarn adams how are you doing i'm all right i'm all right things things are things are things are okay generally speaking Mm -hmm, especially um, what's going on right now <laughs> yeah yeah well it's always a, it's always a risky a risky opening question to ask how somebody is these days but uh yeah yeah no we'll just say it's fine it's cool everything's great <laughs> it is great to have you on we've been talking about trying to do this cast i think for a few weeks now uh, victoria from kid fox was the one who got things organized and it's great to have you in my little uh interview chair or there my virtual chair <laughs> <laughs> yeah nice to be here so, uh, like I said a minute ago, Dwarf Fortress is probably one of the most recognizable games in the colony sim genre. It has become such a, like, mega name in it that I think a lot of people just kind of associate it as the genre. Like, I've seen people say Dwarf Fortress-like these days. And... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it has, there's certainly uh, quite a few games have taken inspiration mm -hmm. from it. I mean, it's, it is odd since there's such a, uh, uh, sort of a long multi multiple lineages of of, of uh, sort of base building or colony slash settlement type games that had been around for you know decades before uh, that uh, you know we're just we're just a sort of part of that uh, you know to the to the the extent the game is under that umbrella um, so yeah I mean it's it's uh, not not our not our genre to start. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it is definitely great uh, to be able to talk to you about this game as uh, there is certainly a lot to discuss in terms of kind of the design of it as well as uh, procedural generation, which is obviously a huge factor. So uh, to get things started with, for people watching us right now live or recorded, uh, Dwarf Ford is one of those games that you are either very intimately knowing about or you have never heard of it. And I have people who are on both sides of that fence who have said, you know, this is a game that I play for hundreds of hours. And then some people are like, what is that? I've never heard of that one. So for those people watching us, could you kind of give us, you know, the elevator pitch or what is Dwarf Fortress? So, yeah, Dwarf Fortress is a, a sort of settlement management game where you, you have a... Um... A group of dwarves that dig into the the side of a mountain and try to eke out an existence there as you grow the the settlement into a sort of larger and more uh, world involved um, uh, actual you know uh, settlement that you know has a few hundred dwarves running around in it uh, and but the game the game kind of aspires to be something more than that it's a uh, I mean we call it a, a fantasy world simulator. Uh, because the the game generates an entire sort of world that the the dwarves live in, there are, are are a bunch of other sort of towns and places of interest, and and critters running around doing things. Uh, this could you know be uh, hundreds of years of history, depending on how long you want to have your computer sit there and and generate it. Um, and uh, uh, lots of, of, of characters that the game creates and then sort of follows their families and what they've been doing and so forth. And those are the same people that arrive at your fortress um, uh, to, to just take up jobs there and sort of continue their lives. Uh, and so, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's like, you know, uh, uh, the, the other sort of settlement management games uh, you might have played when, you, when you're sitting there just working on it, but it sort of exists in this larger uh, universe that we've just been adding to for 18 years. So uh, you can just kind of imagine that it, it's, <laughs> it's gotten kind of complicated and strange uh, over, over the course of this, uh, this work. And uh, up until 
just this year. Uh, it's it's also been a uh, a text based game, kind of like the the traditional uh, roguelikes. Uh, mm -hmm. A few of you out there might might have played. Although if we're talking about people that haven't heard of Dwarf Fortress, then that may not be useful information at all. Uh, but it's um, so it's got a very simple display, uh, but we're adding graphics uh, to it right uh, as we speak here, uh, roughly speaking. Uh, so that's that 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 part is changing, um, but but yeah, that's I suppose the pitch. Mm -hmm. Not an, a long elevator ride though. <laughs> yes, yes, it was. <laughs> but yeah, so the game has been in development from like you said, two thousand two. So. It has certainly been a passion project. I know in interviews, uh, Zach has said that as well, that this is a game that, you know, you guys are obviously very passionate about. And I guess I'm sure this has been asked many, many times. But for my, for my audience, I guess, what was the inspiration or what was, like, I guess, the motivation to make a game like Dwarf Fortress? Oh, I mean, it's 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 been it's something that we've been working on some iteration of for um, what thirty about thirty two years now. I was trying to remember when we started our first very first uh, sort of fantasy type role playing sort of game. Uh, we were just working on as kids together, and we never really stopped doing that, uh, and it kind of turned into this thing. Uh, the the sort of the the, the is interesting because the, the settlement management part was almost incidental to it because uh, we were just making a messier and more complicated uh, role playing game uh, up up until this monstrosity uh, the Armok game that we we put up um, in two thousand which is just kind of an embarrassing weird thing but it kind of kick started the the sort of online process uh, but it it was uh, that was a different kind of uh, uh, thing entirely where we were working on side projects of uh, just little things that would only last like three or four days most of the time and uh, that that was a that was an entirely different mining game uh, about mutants mining with multiple <laughs> arms and so forth and then we're like oh let's make a fantasy game out of this and then it sort of took our our other fantasy role-playing games and mashed them together uh, but um, I mean, the, in terms of the the sort of game inspirations and why we, we why we kind of got started thinking about procedural generation and so forth. I mean, the, the, there's kind of these older uh, games uh, like the the roguelike games and the Ultima games and Starflight that had uh, sort of procedural maps, like just just making a game that you could replay, which is kind of important when your kids writing games. Uh, you can have a few friends come over or whatever, but you're mainly just playing your games yourselves and making things to amuse yourselves. Uh, and that was that was more or less the uh, the reason that we lean so heavily on generating things. Uh, we just kind of wanted to be able to play our own games. And sometimes, I mean, we were, we were actually a little bit successful that with that with one of our projects, we could kind of sit down and play it after school for six or seven hours and not actually work on it, which was a um, kind of a been a while since i've been able to do that but uh but it's uh it's it, yeah so i think i think uh it just it just came up out of this whole uh sort of uh the games we were the games we were playing back then sort of were were going in this sort of simulation direction it wasn't really a procedural direction back then if you think about kind of how the ultimas went mm -hmm. um with more and more sort of wandering about the world the beginning of this kind of open world um genre and also being able to pick up objects and do whatever you want with them and uh, all that kind of thing and then that um works sort of it didn't quite stop but it sort of got um shifted in a different direction when the 3d graphics came out uh around the time ultima 7 came out mm -hmm. um and uh yeah so we just kind of uh, people describe dwarf fortress as sort of an alternate universe where 3d graphics never happened or really 2d graphics for that matter um until 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 this year as i mentioned and uh but instead where the kind of simulation and generation just continued developing um after that i mean that's kind of how we approached it because we did just keep developing we were we were writing games when those games were coming out we just felt didn't really feel like part of that scene because we weren't releasing and we were kids but we were just sort of participating in that and then never really stopped. 
Mm. So you've been so you and Zach have been like working with Brazil Generation like before Dwarf Fortress then? Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We we've uh I mean it's it's kind of I mean when do things count, right? Cuz if you're <laughs> if you're 10 years old rolling dice in a D&D style game where people are losing hit points and stuff, um I mean that's that's not quite procedural generation although I mean in some in some sort of reductive <laughs> sense it is. But uh you know that we we generated I think I generated my first fantasy map with altitudes and biomes and things i must have been 12 or 13 i think um and uh that's around the time i learned i learned c i had no idea how to do that stuff in basic where i was i mean i think you can do a little more bit with basic than we did but we were really kind of pushing it uh to to especially with the memory <laughs> restrictions and and so forth and not knowing how to use multiple source files without just chaining them together it was really kind of a nightmare uh what we were just squeezing out of that thing but uh yeah it, it it's uh <clears throat> excuse, excuse me uh but yeah no so we've been doing it uh forever although i think i've lost the thread of what question you actually asked there <laughs> that's I had right. more to say I had more, I had more to say definitely about what you what you asked <laughs> And I have a few questions as well that uh, from a few fans who submitted them. And for the people watching us live right now, if you do have any questions for Torn about Dwarf Fortress, Proc Gen, anything along those lines, uh, feel free to leave them in the chat and we will get to them as we can fit them in. But like with Procedural Generation, I mean, that is a podcast or two in of itself easily. And... As I was telling uh, Torn before we started, like I'm writing a book, or I just actually I finished writing the first draft on roguelike design, which, for anyone who's watching this, probably knows that procedural generation is a major part of that. And I guess my question for you, and this is one that uh, one of my fans brought up, what do you think makes good proc gen? Again, this is like a two-hour question. We really want to dig into it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I mean, good procedural generation doesn't feel bland. It doesn't just pad things out. It. I mean, it. it I'm, I'm speaking in the negative, which is. I, I don't know. It's like a mathematician's habit or something. Like, what makes good proc gen is not bad proc gen. So we'll talk about <laughs> bad proc gen for a second. Um, it's. Uh, yeah, you don't want it to be bland. This is like the the Kate Compton's bowl of oatmeal principle, as we call it nowadays. Uh, where if you if you generate ten thousand things and they're all the same, then you haven't really succeeded in what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it, it and it goes it kind of there. There's more than that though about like um, it kind of getting obsessed with the numbers when you see a game that's like uh, you know we've made forty two billion things and you can tell that they've just kind of multiplied a bunch of numbers together. <laughs> like because they're swapping out hilts and swapping out blades and swapping mm -hmm. out materials um you know that's that's the beginning not the end of procedural generation yeah. there uh uh so so procedural generation is involved with a good procedural generation is involved with the rest of the game and the player experience uh what you're trying to accomplish i mean the dwarf fortress were an emergent narrative game so our procedural generation, we try to gear it toward generating stories. That's our goal. And the procedural generation hopefully works toward that goal. Um, if, you're, if your game is, is something that's, that's not about uh, narrative or stories, if it, if it was a, more of an aesthetic experience, then you'd want your, your procedural generation to uh, be varied and surprising or try to set the mood. You know, it's, it's, uh, you, you have to accomplish the goal that you set for yourself when you generate things. Yeah. Um, and it, it's not a way of, of removing work. Uh, uh, I mean, obviously it does remove a certain kind of work, but it just replaces it with tuning a generator. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, so there's lots of, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, it's, uh, yeah. Well, as you say, there's more, there's, there's more to say about it, but we can just direct the discussion mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and arrive there. <laughs> Yeah, and as I said at the start, you edited the uh, book of Procedural Generation Game Design by Tanya Short. And one of the quotes I love from that book was that Procedural Generation is a great way to break your game. And this is, I think, one thing for a lot of developers who tend to 
when they first start and they think about it, especially when it comes to roguelike design, that it's very hard, as you said, like, some people will think of it as, if I just procedurally generate this, you know, the game makes itself. It will be done, you know, in half the time, and it will be easy. As you said, I can say it has 70,342 variants in it. But good procedural generation, as you said, it can't be boring. And on conversely, it also can't be just 100% chaos. Because we've seen, unfortunately, some games where it's just like, okay, here's a level, the stairways are leading up into nothingness, there's 27 bathrooms, you know, there's a table on top of a bed, on top of a fireplace. It's random. <laughs> yeah, and that's just another bowl of oatmeal, but you're using, like, multicolored flakes or something like that. I mean, it's just... It there is structure, right? There's there's it's a big thing that we have in Dwarf Fortress is is kind of layers of structure guiding the 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 generation. Like the mm -hmm. the map has like about well more than this, but four different sort of guiding uh, structures that live on top of it as you zoom in on the map. Um, whereas you, I mean, there are plenty of sort of noise algorithms and so forth that let you zoom infinitely in and out because they're just kind of using mathematical functions that you can resolve any way you like. Uh, but that by itself just leads to just wobbliness. There's just, you can look at this and it's wobbly and you look at another place and it's wobbly. Uh, but if you, if you, if you add sort of um, either handcraft or other procedural structures that um, add uh, something, you know, related to the game for us in the map context would be like rivers or, uh, the the sort of um, multiple layers of sort of rainfall or where does a road exit uh, the map that we kind of store at different levels. And then the, the map itself can start to make more sense. And those guiding structures can also be varied uh, over time um, and, and so forth or with player actions. I mean, there's, there's uh, procedural generation can be responsive to player action. Uh, and then... It, if, if that's you know part of your game, uh, then you can accomplish that. And for things like um, like you know random staircases and 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 things like that, I mean that's uh, there's lots of different ways to to deal with that as well. Um, you know, in procedural generation, you can verify that your levels make sense. You can run statistical algorithms on your on your levels and kind of rerun them if your generator's fast enough. Uh, and and it's your responsibility to do that. Uh, when you're, when you're, when you're making your, um, mm -hmm. your, your generators. I mean, one of the, one of the best things you can do when you make a generator is to not make the generator until you've written down, um, you know, in whatever your favorite format is, what you expect the output to look like and what you expect it to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and if your generator doesn't accomplish that, then you need to think about it a little bit harder. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, a few more questions. These are a few questions that came from my chat before. And then we'll get to a few of the questions that were brought up here. Uh, one of my friends asked jokingly, and this is a question that Tarn actually asked me just before we started, of course, is what is a roguelike? And we don't really have to answer that one. I just want to put that like on the record here, that this is a question that I've heard, I think, at least 500 times in the last five months of writing my roguelike book. Yeah, no, no, you're you're gonna you, if you if you're gonna position yourself as an authority on the mm -hmm. topic, then 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 this is uh, this is uh, the 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 uh, the swamp that you're entering oh, now, yes. and you'd better have hall boots. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, but but yeah, no. What's a rogue like? A rogue like is whatever you want it to be. It's great. Um, <laughs> I should have I should have stolen that for the book. That would have been perfect. <laughs> but uh, well, there's also the rogue light too. Mm -hmm. um, the rogue, the rogue light is a is is another thing that's um, and additionally, I mean, the, it may or may not involve procedural generation. It may or may not involve permadeath. It may or may not involve dungeon mm -hmm. crawling. It may or may not <laughs> involve um, uh, well, text graphics to some people. I mean, there, there's there's a uh, there's there's a lot of different things. I mean, when you when you look at the, like the traditional roguelike community. Uh, Oh, working off the the controversial Berlin interpretation of the roguelike, which I don't remember if it was like sixty points of these are different things, and you can score on the scale. And I don't remember that the original rogue does that well, or any of the roguelikes do that great on it. 
Uh, so it's it's uh, or the things thought to be roguelikes. Uh, but that was that was something that people tried to use to position themselves, and then it kind of turned out to be kind of a gatekeeping document or something. I mean, it's just not. Um, it, it's it's. I mean, but there are a lot. There's only you know there's a lot of games, but there's only a finite number of games that have been written, and we can kind of judge them by their roguelikiness or just look at the communities right i mean it's like um you know if 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 uh art is you know a thing that people talk about um you know it's 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 art and people are talking about it and there's a community developing around it then uh we can look to the different communities to see um what counts as a roguelike to them uh and uh i mean there's like i i mentioned it again before before we uh started started streaming here but there's the uh the roguelike celebration is kind of a a, a great um example of this because uh like most most or some great portion of the speakers at the roguelike celebration don't write um what most people would call roguelikes and i mean so i mean that pretty broadly or they don't write games at all uh it's just sort of a celebration of procedural generation uh narrative um uh, even, even just sort of technical, um, technical stuff. Um, like there was a whole talk about how to use hashes instead of, um, other, uh, generators in order to have certain properties for your random number generation. And, uh, it's, it, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's just, um, but, and then people, but there was also just another talk about like the, the GPT at the time, the GPT two model for, uh, for kind of text generation. Uh, and there, the, so, so it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's that, that has a very kind of, uh, big tent approach to mm -hmm. roguelikes. And I, I think that's fine. Uh, people use the, the phrase traditional roguelike, uh, mm -hmm. nowadays, uh, to talk about the other ones, but, um, uh, and even that's contentious, of course, uh, oh, yes. you know, um, so it's, and, and yeah, and I, and it's like, I'm not also not authority on this because, uh, Dwarf Fortress, no one ever accused Dwarf Fortress of being a roguelike. Um, it's been described as roguelike adjacent. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, uh, that that's, uh, <laughs> I'm happy with that. I mean, there's, there, there is, I, I mean, we, I guess we could mention that there's, there is an RPG buried inside of Dwarf Fortress, the adventurer mode, where you can play mm -hmm. one character and just kind of wander around the world. And, you know, it has hallmarks of roguelikiness, uh, permanent death. The, the maps are all generated. You can pick up little objects and you've got all kinds of menus. The menu system is inspired by roguelike games. Most of the keys that you press are like roguelike games. But um, there are ways in which it is not, not considered roguelike -y. Uh, You don't go into a, uh, a dungeon, uh, one dungeon. Uh, you don't try and get an object at the end. That's a big thing about roguelikes ever since the first one. Uh, whether it's an amulet or an orb or whatever, just grabbing, you know, some some critter down at the bottom and pulling it out of the dungeon. Um, but uh, I mean, there's 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 a it, at, at some point the uh, the word is as useful as as far as it goes. I mean, if we're uh, trying to bring people together or trying to help people with game recommendations. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's. Uh, I mean, the roguelike tag may be overused on on Steam or not. I don't really know. Uh, and you know, people can kind of. I mean, it helps people a little bit grouping things as much as the adventure tag does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in, in my book, I talked about like again, like the difference between like roguelike and roguelite design. We've even been seeing you know action roguelikes, deck building roguelikes. <laughs> I'm waiting for no. There have already been, I think, first-person shooter roguelikes. I'm waiting yeah. for racing roguelikes <laughs> to see what how yeah. that would work. Yeah, yeah, that'd be like Excite Bike or something. <laughs> uh, well, that was a level editor. I mean, you could have turned that Excite Bike level editor into a generator, um, and then uh, and then yeah, there you go. Um, it's, it's scary to think about permanent death in a racing game, but uh, I mean, I guess you're out when you're out. I mean, uh, well. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I haven't played any modern racing games, so I don't know anything about meta progression and careers and uh, that kind of thing. Um, so I, I imagine that a lot of that's already been done because those genres tend to have pretty advanced um, kind of 
outlier games when you think about like football manager games and that kind of thing right Mm -hmm. um so i'm sure there's some pretty interesting racing games out there maybe one of them is a roguelite already (laughs) all right and we're not too if we're not uh, too careful we'll be just like stuck on talking about roguelikes and procedural generation for the next like hour or two and we may need to if you're free in the future we may need to have like that kind of like roguelite or roguelite (laughs) kind of podcast at some point (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, although, uh, yeah, you, 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 we're speaking of people that might come on here. There are certainly authoritarian people, more authorities <laughs> on this uh, than myself uh, as, as a tangential player in the roguelike community. Um, okay. A lot of, it's an amazing thing about the genre. Another thing that, that might characterize it uh, as, uh, you know, whether the games are new or old, it tends to attract people that work on games for a long ass time. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, Sammy in Finland's been working on Unreal World for 30 years or something. Um, mm-hmm. that, that one's been around. I remember I downloaded that off of somewhere. I don't remember where it was, uh, back in like 1993 when I was, when I was, <laughs> uh, you know, still, still in high school or something. And, uh, like, oh, here's a Finnish kind of survival roguelike game. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and then I, you know, he's still working on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, a lot of games, a lot of the games are like that. <laughs> so there's, there'll, there'll be somebody, somebody, some, somebody can certainly speak with the great authority on, <laughs> on that topic. All right. Uh, two more questions uh, from one of my fans who's a big fan of Dwarf Forge who couldn't make it to the chat live. And then we will start going through some of these questions that came in through the chat. So uh, he asked, uh, what features or ideas have you done in Dwarf, For- in Dwarf Fortress that you are most proud of to see brought into other games? Huh. Yeah, let's see. Um, I mean, I can't... I don't know. I can't claim credit for for some of these things. Like, because um, there there have been named characters and, and things. I mean, we're kind of... Well, it's it's very hard to be first at something, so I'd hate to to, to say any of that. Um, but certainly, um, helping to popularize characters that are that have names that you can follow that aren't just like person person named by their type, like orc warrior or something like that, right? But giving them names and um, uh, so so seeing that happen in not just settlement games but um you know to 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 whatever extent and these are all complicated questions because people's inspirations come from all over the place but for instance the extent to which we um we were a part of inspiring something like the nemesis system from the the mordor games and so forth um and that and how that kind of turned into like you know what we're seeing with um with like they they did something similar in the in- Assassin's Creed games, but then there's things like Watchdog Legions coming out now, which I of course don't really claim any kind of inspiration for at all. But um, it's it's kind of part of this this you know um, outgrowth of of that kind of thinking, and uh, it's it's cool to see how how that's kind of uh, spread out that people are thinking about emergent narrative. Um, and, and the, the things that we've been, we've been championing, uh, with our own work, um, was, is, is, is really quite, quite satisfying because that's more than like the map generation and so forth. The, uh, the, the focus for us has been on like, can you sit down and kind of have the game, uh, co-author a story with you, mm-hmm. uh, and, and seeing people think about that more explicitly, um, and, taking actions to, to make their games accomplish this has been, has been really cool, you know, and whatever small part we've had in, in causing that to happen is, uh, mm-hmm. is, is I mean, I, I, yeah, pride would be a strong word when you're so unsure of influence in such a huge industry, right? But yeah. it's, uh, certainly we've had something to do with it. And as a quick tangent, like talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, games that kind of let you co-author a story. I mean, so have you ever had a chance to play King of Dragon Pass? So I know that's another uh, one that's held to very high standards as well. Yeah, well, yeah, King of Dragon Pass. I played it, played it back back when it was 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 new, um, way back when. Uh, and of course, uh, I have 
not gotten a chance to play Six Ages, um, mm-hmm. the the sequel, uh, which is which is like a stable mate of mine at Kit Fox Games. Uh, I actually met uh, David at uh, at PAX um, when we were we had our little our little Kit Fox booth with uh, <laughs> with Dwarf Fortress and Six Ages uh, <laughs> there, uh, which was cool. Um, and uh, yeah, no, it's 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 excellent. It's uh, of genre defying too, which I always like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually spoke to him on an earlier podcast as well. That was another uh, really solid conversation about that kind of game. Uh, let me see another, and then this other question. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, what features have you seen the most negative feedback on, and what did you do? Like, I guess a common say or to try and fix it. Uh, there's a lot here, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the most, um, I mean, I, I'd, I'd say, um, it's probably a tie between, uh, a more, the, the more boring one we won't spend any time on at all is just the speed, uh, that things move when you get a bunch of dwarves. Uh, of course, people don't like that when their game starts to slow down mm-hmm. and we've slowly sped the game up. Like here's a 10% improvement after a year and so forth. Um, and that's, that's just a process. Um, I mean, we could always just make the forts cap out at 40 dwarves or something and have mm-hmm. less of a problem, but um, that's also not something people would be super satisfied with. Mm-hmm. But I'd say the more interesting uh, answer here is the stress system, uh, just because that's, that's been kind of an ongoing struggle from the beginning of the game. Uh, the, uh, way back when, and we've and we've had you know many attempts uh, to to change how this works, and we always land in a new, not quite right place. Uh, but the originally the dwarves would, uh, if if the dwarves would have friendships and family members and so forth, and if uh, one of them met with tragedy, then all of the uh, friends and family of that dwarf would have a kind of instant negative mood, a uh, pretty heavy hit. And if even one of those, you know, that pushed them over the edge and they started throwing tantrums and, and otherwise causing trouble for the fort, uh, then the mood would spread, right? And uh, that was that was uh, called, the, the players called that a tantrum spiral because uh, the one one little, you know, flicked over domino and the um, the fortress would just fall apart. And so we, we a lot of kind of the the sort of inner workings of the dwarf, the emotions and thoughts and uh, personality stuff, uh, kind of the one of the the main drivers of that is um, kind of fixing these these sort of emotional problems that that would develop. And so we added the stress system, which was a way of of taking happiness and smoothing it out over time, so that a a dwarf that was unhappy for a short period wouldn't throw tantrums immediately, but it would just add to the stress in their life that it kept track of. And then if the stress got high enough, they'd throw a tantrum. So it's kind of like a calculus thing, right? You can mm-hmm. you can you can integrate and take derivatives and so forth, have second order things and so forth, and and things smooth out. Uh, so the dwarves were not mollified though. Uh, it it just led to new issues. Uh, but it was, I mean, it was, it was, it was not a, not a bad idea and it's still in there. Um, and in fact, it's gotten sort of advanced enough as a mess now that one of the principal problems is that there are long-term memories that can cause dwarves to relive stressful mm-hmm. moments, which in it, in it by itself just sort of adds character and, and adds uh, sort of this feeling that you're, you've got uh, people in the, in the fortress that are developing, that are changing over time due to what's happening. Um, and, uh, I mean, an amusing one I just, just saw online, uh, not long ago was a, a dwarf that had been forced to drink vomit and therefore kind of their personality changed so that they always sort of believed in, in sort of having, uh, themselves put together well, decorum and, and manners and so <laughs> forth, because they didn't want to relive this kind of experience. And the player had no idea when that had happened. <laughs> which is uh generally when they are not don't have another water source their water source became polluted and so forth oh. but the, the and that's fine that's kind of what we were going for it's a disgusting example but it's it's uh kind of what we were going for that you would have some kind of like if the fortress was starving and something terrible happened then it would cause these changes 
in the dwarves that would sort of mark them for time, even if they live for another hundred years. Um, but the problem is uh, that there's just some tuning problems with that. So right now, rainfall appears to be one of the greatest sort of recurring nightmare stressors that the, the dwarf <laughs> experience. Like, I was caught in the rain and I'm miserable and that's going to change my whole life. <laughs> and uh, so there's just something about how the thoughts are selected for short term memory and then moved into long term and core life changing memories. Um, there's all kinds of buckets and groups and processes we've tried to put in to control that. And you, one of these things slipped through the cracks and then the the dwarves kind of, you know, uh, re, you know, eventually fall apart. It's not like the tantrum spiral days, but it's, it's kind of more frustrating in a way because you play a dwarf, a fortress for a long enough time. And there's these dwarves, especially ones that are sort of predisposed to be stressed out and so forth. And it's good to have some variation in the personalities. But this would be like having one of those Crusader Kings traits or something that if they have a little trait that says susceptible to stress, then you kind of know that know that dwarf in the current version of Dwarf Fortress is marked for death. <laughs> it's like uh, they're going to get in a rainstorm someday and then that's it for them after five years of like <laughs> mulling it over. Um, it's also like pouring yeah. right now outside my window. This is a really great conversation. It's going to score <laughs> me for life, too. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll, I mean, but but some of some of the ones are a little more complicated than that, right? The uh, the um, the rainfall is just uh, some bug that needs to be hunted down. But then there are other ones, like the um, one of the other major stressors is uh, hauling bodies after a siege, right? Mm -hmm. You've got dead goblins everywhere. You've got dead dwarves everywhere. Uh, hopefully not too many, or else there is no excuse and the fort could fall apart. But if say there's just a few, or say it's all goblins. Because uh, you did such a good job and th that you, you should feel good about yourself, but instead your dwarves are hauling bodies to the body pile, right? And each one of those, the game is like, oh, well, that's an intelligent thinking creature that's a, a, that has a soul and is a, is a, is a, is a, you know, a, a fellow thinker on this earth. And that they're dead should really give you kind of this existential slap in the face. Uh, and so the dwarves are sitting there hauling the bodies, crying, you know, and and sometimes shaken, fallen on the ground and unable to move, and then they continue hauling the body. And uh, it's not quite true to life. I mean, it is in some sense and isn't. It's like uh, we never wanted to, I mean, we don't want to be some kind of like grim, dark edgelord game, but we also <laughs> don't want to gloss over the, the um, sort of uh, consequences of violence and uh, what, you know, what, what it means when somebody's dead and so forth and what it means to kill somebody uh not that i'm a subject matter expert here but uh doing um doing nothing seemed wrong but at the same time I, and we have them become kind of battle hardened slash ptsd but that doesn't kick in at first and if it doesn't kick in at first you can kind of get this memories inside of you that eat you alive which again is not wholly inaccurate i mean uh, you know being in a in a family with you know people that had combat ptsd and so forth uh uh it's not a simple and inconsequential thing but uh it also fucks your game up pretty hard and so we need to kind of work on that uh a bit um kind of one of our sort of steam release um sort of things to work on is what are the what are the bugs that are going to get at people the most and sort of clean that up and not just i mean bugs but also issues right you you have this you know, you know what is a bug what is an issue uh and uh <laughs> you know the games are never never perfect but we're we'll try and and make it make it better all right and it's like how this the chat just like completely segued into talking about the horrors of rain and water <laughs> in the discussion. Um, let's see. Uh, we had quite a bit of questions come in as we've been talking, so we'll see. Uh, we'll go through them now. And in terms of a time check, I'm I think we were going to shoot for around like five thirty my time, which would be probably another yeah. like forty minutes or so. We'll see how things go, but. We're still good in terms of questions for the chat, if you do have any. And I do want to talk more about kind of the uh, release and the publishing by Kit Fox uh, later on in the discussion. Uh, but our next question from RJW asks, uh, what have been some of the biggest hurdles with the magic system? 
Yeah, I mean, we don't have one exactly yet. Uh, so it's 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 premature to talk about like the Myth Magic release and what is that's a big thing that's you know we've been we've been talking about since at least uh, 2016 in some explicit terms when they kind of gave a talk about the Myth Generator and so forth. And then due to various circumstances, we're now working on a Steam release instead of that. And uh, so we haven't quite dived into the um, the more the more kind of like what what are what trouble are we going to actually run into with those generators, uh, but we do have um, some some simple simple stuff uh, right now, little fireball effects, and we just added the intelligent undead kind of Nazguli type critters that have like generated effects to some extent on them, uh, and. Yeah, then it, it, it comes down to kind of like if you're going to generate an effect with targets and side effects and and so forth, and then you've got to write the AI for it, which is which a little bit of a mess about, you know, you have to give them kind of a hint about how it's used. And so you sort of know coming into your generator, well, this, 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 I mean, it's like it's a damage spell, but under what circumstances shall I use this spell? Uh, and, you, and so we have this this field called usage hints right now. It's like this is a major attack spell and so forth, and they'll use it under those circumstances. But right now, um, like we don't have area effect spells yet, but that's another thing. But um, you know, people have, people have kind of worked that stuff out how to target area effect spells without, say, hitting all your friends and that kind of thing. And we'll have some really gnarly versions of that uh, because our stuff can kind of get out of control. Like um, I remember in the old um, uh, SSI gold box games when you're like casting stinking cloud and it hits a two by two area um, and, you know, maybe the cloud drifts a little bit. I don't recall, but here we have some fluids that can get really out of control. <laughs> and uh, so if, if someone casts like magma ball um, <laughs> and it aff affects a two by two area, the two by two area would quickly become like a five by five area as it, as it kind of flowed out mm -hmm. and uh, you, you'd need to account for that, right? Mm. And fortunately, uh, this is not something we're going to lean on here, but it's a an escape hatch as we work on the processes is that uh, procedural generation is allowed to screw up a little bit as long as it's funny. Mm. Um, and like people constantly wasting themselves with magma balls is not funny, but people occasionally wasting themselves with magma balls is fine for a time. <laughs> um, and especially if if other things happen, right? So it's uh, just just that that's kind of the challenges we're we're looking forward to, especially as we continue. I mean, I don't have too many. I don't think it's going to be too difficult to just codify things like generate effects. We already have the structures in place. We just kind of need to populate them. And I'm keeping myself honest by having it always in the moddable text format. Like the generator generates into the text format and then loads out of the text format. And that's uh, beneficial in a lot of ways. It allows the modders to kind of always do what you're doing. And it also means that you're you're not going to as easily step outside the bounds of what's normally possible without at least having the computer take a look at what you, at your work and throw error logs uh, if you screwed up. Um, so that, that part seems... Like there's going to be a lot of complications there, obviously, but it's it's it seems straightforward enough. But then once the critters in the game get their hands on uh -huh. this stuff, like what what on earth are you going to do? <laughs> and then yeah, and that's and it's going to be additionally complicated when it when it starts to get tied into sort of economic and supply stuff, like and interface things about like like some of the questions people were asking uh, when we were originally talking about this is like. If your dwarves can research spells that require new reagents, then how do you how does that like get worked into the stockpile system? You know, how does that get worked into the job system if you get these new things created? And you know, fortunately, we have some infrastructure in place for that as well. Like we have the custom workshop thing that the modders can use to create their own workshops, and that's something that we can lean on as well. Like like here's a new definition for a new workshop, like it's a potion mixing workshop or something like that. It, but it, it 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 would tie into like a procedural system rather than a hard coded system, and um, that that kind of thing could just appear after certain certain steps have been taken or certain dwarves arrive at your fort and so forth. Uh, and it's 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 going to be a going to be a nice um, you know explosive mess hopefully. <laughs> there, that's game dev in a nutshell. It's an explosive mess. <laughs> 
Uh, let's see. Uh, Kiru, Kiru, I hope I didn't butcher that too much, asked, uh, how does fire, fire damage work in Dwarf Fortress? What are properties of fire, and how does it interact with stuff, fat, skin, and armor? Stuff like that. <laughs> well, that's, that, yeah, and that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, uh, it's terrible right now, because the, the, the burning damage um happens on items right you see the little x's form on them and then they eventually vanish and it, it's interacting with the little temperature points and things that are in there um but for people uh that damage uh if it's happening at all doesn't happen fast enough but the fire has a temperature that raises the like the like there are there are, there are kind of warm-blooded creatures and generally like if a dwarf is on fire the you know they try and re regain their temperature equilibrium which normally works when it's cold outside or something but the fire is you know if the fire is 500 or in your magma and you're up at like 1200 something degrees or whatever and this i don't know fahrenheit centigrade whatever um i know it makes a difference but these are hot this is just hot stuff and so it overwhelms that system immediately and then what happens and it's very unfortunate how this works right now is that the, because the fat has the lowest melting point of the uh, the layers, the tissue layers that are available, um, melting slash flashpoint, whatever. Uh, what generally happens, I, if, as I recollect, when people catch on fire is that their fat layer melts and they become kind of a giant bag of grease. And um, then they don't necessarily die because the game's like, ah, you didn't need that anyway. It's like, congratulations on your weight loss or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of messed up. Um, and... Uh, so the, the answer is not very well. It doesn't work very well. Um, it's aspirational, the aspirational fire damage system of Dwarf Fortress. It was better when things just incinerated you. It used to be how it worked. Um, but when we, when we went over to the tissue layer system, we didn't, didn't quite capture burning alive properly, sadly. I mean, we don't really have smoke in inhalation. It doesn't kill you. It just irritates you right now, I think. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, in terms of things to work on, that's 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 certainly a certainly one of them. I do like how like this chat is going like all over the place. We we were talking about rain uh, causing emotional <laughs> scarring to magma balls killing everyone. And now we're talking about how properly burn people. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure like YouTube right now is like listening to us going. What are these two guys talking about right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's it's it, it is as I said. It's sort of a it's it's a uh, accreted layers of game. Uh, it's kind of like one of those canyon walls where you can see the Cretaceous period or something. Um, it, it yeah. So it it gets, it gets strange, and then there's just stuff that's just flat out missing. Um, so it's it's a uh, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's it's a it's a fun process. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, next question from Thomas Rabbit asked, uh, what has been the biggest snag or hardest thing with porting Dwarf Fortress into the Steam release? Huh. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, um, uh, I don't, yeah, the, 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 the rendering engine we're using, um, uh, because it's the one that I'm capable of writing is, uh, limited, um, in, into how much I can layer stuff and how much I can animate stuff and how much I can kind of slide things around um, uh, due, to, due to not wanting to, to have too many screen refreshes and that kind of crap. Uh, and that's, that's been something that we're, you know, we'd like to move on from that, but I haven't been able to do that yet. And um, that, that, part, that part puts a lot of kind of um, restrictions uh, on what we can do, uh, which is frustrating at times. Uh, then the, um, generally the, the kind of, um, uh, just rewriting every screen, uh, to have a nice interface, uh, is kind of outside my typical skill set. uh, as people can tell who've played the game. Um, you know, we're trying our best and the, the, uh, people have, uh, had positive, uh, reception to the screens and things that we posted so far. Uh, but, um, certainly it's, it's, it's been tricky to keep motivation up the same way, right? Uh, I mean, you used to be able to put the things that we've been talking about in the game and, uh, have them happen. 
and you still get some of that, right? The the artists are amazing, right? So I get a, a you know a pictures of uh, even pictures of walls. Like we just got back the the pictures of all of the minerals, right? So you can tell your your hematite from your your uh, kaolinite or whatever, and uh, that's cool, right? Uh, and you can see them on the screen. And uh, when you see animals running around, or you see the you know sixteen frames river animation, uh, then that's really satisfying. But when I'm doing like, um, uh, for instance, I'm I'm going to be starting the building placement interface momentarily, whatever that may be today. Uh, then like okay you're placing a bridge and you need to be able to size it you need to be able to say if it's a draw bridge which direction does it draw uh and what what material do you want to use to build it and so forth and these are all things that we did already uh back in text graphics there are going to be some you know minor improvements to how that works you'll be able to use the mouse and things will be displayed a little bit nicer but it's like to me, without the user experience skill set, it's not like a like a you know a, a, an intellectual enterprise that I find fulfilling. Uh, just because I don't really know what I'm doing, I'm sure people that work in this field can have a lot of appreciate the challenges more than I do um, and come up with creative solutions to things. Whereas I just kind of like, okay, you know, we we can put some buttons, put some scroll bars, make sure it doesn't suck and you know do that for another x number of days it's been we've been working on this in earnest for about seven months um that's a whole story about you know we we signed the contract two years ago but i was working on the villains release i'm like oh we got to put up the villains release and um so we worked on that for like a year or whatever um and now we're working on the steam stuff uh, and, uh, yeah, so it's been a long time and it's, um, that part I don't think will ever be satisfying for me. Um, but, uh, there is enough about it that we're, you know, able to keep working. And of course we want to get the release up and get health insurance, that kind of thing. It's cool. Uh, and, um, so yeah, yeah. So lots of, lots of different, different things that are stumbling blocks in the process, I suppose. All right. And... I guess to uh, kind of answer part of Pony's question, what has been like the hardest, most painful part? So I guess for something a little bit more fun, uh, what has been the easiest or most fun part of developing Dwarf Fortress? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, we try, to, we try not to make things too easy for us because if it's easy, we just add complications to it until it's, it stops being easy <laughs> to do. But... Uh, yeah, I mean that's and I I like um, I like adding animals to the game. They all look the same. It sucks, but we're working on it. Um, it's funny that like what distinguishes a cow and an alligator in Dwarf Fortress is not nearly so much as should be distinguishing them. <laughs> They're roughly similar sized creatures, um, sadly. And if a cow bites you, uh, you know, it's not too much different from an alligator biting you, which is not a future that I like to think of in terms of like the <laughs> livestock industries and so Ooh. forth, the future safety of our farm workers. But uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it was fun to, to to put in our critters. We like our critters, adding all the, adding, adding, adding things like that's fun. <laughs> um, because I mean, the things that are ultimately more satisfying are adding, adding systems and things, but then that's not, that's not so simple. Um, uh, so it's, it's, a yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's interesting trying to think of an answer to that question. Cause the, uh, <laughs> never thought about what was actually easy to do. Uh, what, what, what was easy? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I mean, enjoy, I enjoy stuff that's, that's flashy when you get it done. Um, like the, uh, like the water system and so forth, flooding, flooding people and, um, making the little explosions and things, uh, doing cavens was fun, but yeah, but if I get back to cavens, that's not going to be easy anymore. It used to be, oh yeah, we added a seven by seven area that if you dig out seven by seven underground without putting a support or leaving a pillar, then it will collapse after X amount of time. But when we went over to a 3d grid, um, uh, that system didn't work anymore. And now it just goes based on like flood fill connection. Like if you actually disconnect the map, it will fall on you. 
Uh, but we'd love to do a more complicated system than that. Um, and it'd be fun, you know, great fun when that's working again, um, because it's always fun to squish people. Uh, that's just how it is. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it's, um, yeah, that's not going to be simple anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, no, I'll, I'll waste too much time trying to think of an actual answer to this question, sadly. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, another question uh, from uh, Telvino asked, uh, do you have any plans to someday add death interactions? Creatures can cast on death, like witches cursing townsfolk and things like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, I believe, like, we had this really, really bizarre development phase um, some years back. Like, we used to break things into, like, core features of the game and then kind of bug reports and issues and then kind of bloated features we could add to the game on a lark, right? And that was three things. And then we decided to add these things called power goals just because we were feeling, yeah, I don't know if it was a lot, it wasn't a lack of motivation. It was just kind of, we wanted to amuse ourselves or something. And kind of mash unrelated features together and turn them into these weird story vignettes. And so there's these really strange things listed buried deep on the dev pages on the website. And there are things in there about witches cursing towns and so forth. There was something we wanted to do with the night creatures, right? We have these sort of trolls that will kidnap people and we have these spirits that appear at night and the ghosts come back from the dead and the vampires infiltrate the fortress and the werewolves cause their problems. The necromancers raise zombies and experiment on people. The mummies come back. Um, and I probably missed something or something, but like uh, the, the, um, thing we didn't really get to is this kind of long-term curse effect, which is certainly something we wanted to do and then kind of give you a sort of um, experience and when you're playing the RPG mode or when you're playing fort mode of a way of interacting with these creatures in a longer term way than just chopping them to bits. And um, it's, it's uh, yeah, something that, that takes... Like we have these regional curses um, that are just like the 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 you know it's now raining goblin blood. It's intriguing that people know that. I mean, when when the, the the announcement says it is now raining goblin blood, and you're sitting there playing the fortress, and the ground turns all red because you embarked in a very very bad place. You <laughs> didn't have good good settlement planning skills and decided to embark in the evil forest where it rains goblin blood, but. <laughs> yes, intriguing. I don't know if they can tell when they rub it between their fingers. Like, oh, that's definitely goblin blood or whatever. Maybe it's the smell. Who knows? But uh, the that's a form of regional curse. There's a few others, like the winds that turn people into zombies and so forth. And that structure is all set in place so that we could have regional curses on villages and so forth. I think part of the problem is, we, and, and again, this is a common recurring theme in Dwarf Fortress issues, is like, oh, well, we didn't have the sort of economy set up for the townsfolk. So if you wanted to make a curse where like all of the uh, the dairy cows have curdled milk now or whatever, um, then uh, it wouldn't mean anything. It would mean something in, in the fort mode, um, but then we'd need to figure out why the witches are cursing you in fort mode without having the historical sim to lean on. Um, and of course, there's a lot of reasons why a witch would want to curse a dwarf fortress, um, especially if they like trees and the other things um, you can have elf elf witches cursing dwarf fortresses would certainly work um, and be in 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 a bit of theme with the game and so forth. But the uh, and so yeah, just haven't gotten there. Have some structures in place and have not made it. Okay, <laughs> I think I am caught up with questions in chat. If I missed anything, uh, feel free to post more in the comments. Or if you have any more questions to ask, uh, please let me know. Let me do a quick double check. I think that is it. But again, chat is moving fast. We have a lot of fans <laughs> in it <laughs> today. And thank you for tuning in, those of you watching this live. I guess here's another question for you that I'm curious about. Like In the last like 20 minutes, you described a lot of things, you know, from curses, to squishing people, death rain, magma balls uh magic fire and all that and like for somebody watching this like completely blind they're probably wondering just what the heck is going on in this game and like we said like, you you and zach have been working on this game for about 18 years now and i just have to ask 
how do you decide or do you have like a plan for like what you focus on next or is it just a case of if it sounds cool let's just try and put this into the game yeah there's a there's a there's a, a mixture of things here and of course the uh the long-term fans will will keep me honest in terms of like you know if i have a plan is it the plan that we still have three or four years from now uh if we remember the caravan arc and the army arc and uh uh, these other planning notes that did not transpire despite having, you know, very sort of lengthy documents with bullet points on the internet <laughs> telling you what's going to happen. Um, and then getting, you know, sidetracked or blocked um, or d otherwise distracted and and not doing that. Of course, we're coming back to those things, but haven't hasn't happened yet. But uh, so, it, but, but generally, you know, Zach and I will sit and talk about, you know, what we, what we want to have happen. Uh, we have, lots of like long-term goals. We've been sort of talking about this magic release, for instance, um, that for a very long time and have set aside, you know, what we want to do there, why we want to do it, uh, which is like basically because we don't quite have a fantasy setting yet. And we wanted to really see how far we could leverage procedural generation on that. So part of that is kind of pushing boundaries, seeing where, where we can take things, um, in keeping with um, you know what the game is and what we want it to be, uh, part of it is just giant holes. Like we keep coming back to the economy. I mentioned just just again, like somehow which is not going in related to not having certain production pipelines set up on NPC settlements or whatever. And so we wanted to set that up for a time. And so that gets that just sits there pretty high up on the list. Um, and you know what you know whether we've gotten to it or not since the first time we talked about it in two thousand seven or whatever. But uh, I mean, we have to a certain extent. There's a lot of sort of hidden work on that, um, but it's not it's not in yet. Uh, so I mean that that but that that that's one of the prime movers is kind of what what sort of story deficits or feature deficits that would you know then lead to curing a story deficit. Um, but a lot of times we're just on something and then uh, it turns out that, you know, oh, we're interested in this now. And part of game development, especially when you're not working in a large team, is being able to capture your motivation when you have it and utilizing that, right? It's one of your precious currencies as a developer is like, if I feel inspired enough to add a procedural instrument uh, generator, uh, then I should go ahead with it because, you know, it might not be able to recapture this this motivation and uh then that happened uh when we were doing i mean that was a very strange arc right when we added the the taverns and i may be misremembering the chronology here but when we added the taverns but then also added the procedural sort of poetry forms and musical forms instruments and dances uh to give mm -hmm. thing people things to do uh in the in the in the taverns and uh, like procedural instruments and procedural like tom bird generations to figure out how they sound right like what is a ringing sound and what elements make that up and so forth uh what registers do the instruments have and that kind of thing so as you can see i was kind of fascinated by that kind of thing at the time and threw it in there and that's happened an awful lot um you know people notice us coming back to night creatures because we you know, we're interested in that kind of thing. And so we do revisit that a little more often than we should uh, mm -hmm. on some metrics, not on others. And uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's uh, I mean, sometimes we do add things for the good of the project. <laughs> sometimes that, sometimes, sometimes that. <laughs> uh, let's see. A uh, random question from uh, Talvino asks, uh, you mentioned playing a uh, Cyberpunk 2020 ages ago. Do you still play RPGs at all? And if so, are you at all interested in the new Cyberpunk game or Cyberpunk Red? So I'm, uh, I don't really have a chance to play RPGs uh, like pen and paper ones anymore. Um, it's kind of a typical story. I think uh, we had our friend group in high school and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And, uh, then we moved across the country and uh, there wasn't a robust internet at the time. Um, and uh, like this, like talking video chat, I mean, right in 1996, wasn't yeah. as much of a thing. 
Uh, and especially with multiple people, like four or five people or whatever, um, where you can just do that now, which is amazing. But uh, so we, we fell off that. Um, still read a lot of books, a lot of, a lot of RPG books, uh, just because it's fun to read rule sets and so forth. Which is kind of a strange habit. But um, so, so, but yeah, no, back, back we played that. It's one of the, one of the inspirations that got us to um, getting rid of hit points um was was that the the system from like the friday night firefight uh um helper thing um uh, the, the the what are they called supplementary rule sets or it was one of the little books that was included in the box or whatever um it just talked about you know here you get shot in the arm this happens you get shot in the face this happens uh and we're like oh you can just put that in a computer game uh, of course it had been done uh um multiple times but we hadn't played games like fantasy with ph in front of it uh, you get your arms lopped off in that one, and that was in the 80s, um, and uh, plenty of others, uh, examples of, of that kind of thing. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, I know, I'm, and I, but but playing the playing the modern the modern game, um, I haven't been following it too closely. Uh, uh, it depends on a lot of things, um, mm -hmm. you know. How does the how does how did it actually turn out? I mean. Uh, I like The Witcher 3. Um, I had fun playing that. Um, of course, they're kind of murdering their employees right now, which isn't cool. Mm -hmm. um, shouldn't do that. And, um, you know, that that's part of the decision-making process as well. Uh, that's a complicated question. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, so that's, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. And then the, the, the Keanu Reeves draw um, didn't get me, didn't get me, didn't get me to get, get me to watch a John Wick movie, I guess, but it won't, uh, hasn't got me to buy, buy his video game yet. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Uh, let's see. Uh, Matthew asked, uh, have you had a chance to play Spelunky and what are your thoughts on it? Oh, Spelunky is excellent. I, I, I haven't played Spelunky 2, if that's the question. That's, that's hot off the presses and I'm always late. <laughs> um, but no, Splunky's great. Uh, Splunky, uh, I'm not good at it. Um, I had, I did, I did get through it, which is, which is something. But um, yeah, uh, that's 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 difficult. But, but no, it's cool to see uh, good procedural generations. What we're talking about there again, right? Um, being able to make a platformer type level um, is not simple, uh, and uh, kind of. Um, the the way that there are modular building blocks that have slight variants is is kind of good practice and it's um, it's something that that was uh, coming out of that game was pretty pretty influential mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, it's uh, um, uh, yeah no that was, and that that had a good impact and of course started the whole the whole the the beginnings of the roguelike genre. Um, uh, begins with Spelunky, of course, and uh, yeah, no, that was, that was it. Was cool. It was good to see see a well put together thing kind of um, have that kind of effect. I think. All right. Uh, let me see. Time check. It's about five twenty two my time. Um, I guess um, soft stop wise. Do you think another ten fifteen minutes works for you? Uh sure. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't gotten a message um from from zach yet that the work day is beginning so uh <laughs> but but he he may very well be beginning the work day in seven minutes and we'll just have to play that as it, okay. as it goes all right in that case this will be uh, officially last call for questions from the chat and yeah and if you are free in the future tom i would love to have you back on because i think we can certainly uh, go at length about any one of these topics <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's been fun all right, so uh, with that, I do have a few questions regarding the actual release of Dwarf Fortress on Steam. And again, I don't think we'll have enough time to get to everything, but I do at least want to bring that up because we've mentioned a few bits about it in the chat. So for the, the new people watching this, right, who haven't heard of Dwarf Fortress, the game has been available for free on the uh, Bay 12 site for a very long time. I know you guys have been supported by fans and supporters along those lines. 
So with the release of it on Steam, I know this was kind of a big news for you guys. And for the people watching who haven't heard, uh, what has been kind of leading into the actual an actual release on Steam? Yeah, like like um, well, what is it? What does that mean exactly? Uh, uh, like just the like what work has been going into it, or what caused it to happen, or yeah. what's the time? What's the timeline? There's a lot of a lot of questions there. Uh, but yeah, no, we we basically um, had had some some health issues here and needed to square away uh, our U.S. health insurance, which is always fun. Uh, so we decided to pivot into uh, being a Steam, Steam game and itch, Steam slash itch game with um, with um, customers and that kind of thing, uh, exchanging money for for goods, this sort of stuff that we hadn't been doing up until now in quite the same way. Although we, of course we've had uh, PayPal contributions and Patreon uh, and support uh, and so forth, and. Uh, so so yeah we've we've switched gears we now have uh, a couple of the uh, sort of um uh modders hardcore modders of the game uh are now working on art uh for the game um and we've we've kind of uh hooked up with uh our our uh, friends at kid fox game and i mean friends before we were you know uh, affiliated with them uh so it's like actual friends at kid fox game uh, that um, are are kind of handling some Steam stuff and handling the contracting of people to do things, uh, which is outside again outside of my skill set. I don't know how to do paperwork. Um, <laughs> it's like one of those things that indie people end up learning, and I'm sure I could kind of go through that process, but it's just as soon not. Um, and uh, so it's cool, yeah. So we're we're putting graphics and some more music and uh, putting it together uh, and. Uh, that that's an ongoing process and not coming out this year. There's not that much year left and it's been mm -hmm. a great year, right? Everyone knows how great this year has been. So, uh, oh, yes, yes. Not, not too hard to imagine it not coming out this year, but, um, uh, next year seems pretty, well, we're doing well, right? We got screens, we got graphics. What else do you need? Um, <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, that's, it's, it's been, a been a, been a fun, been a fun ride. Uh, don't know if there's, uh, been, answer specifically what you were looking for there but mm. yeah again the, this year has just been the uh it's been the randomness of, i think dwarf fortress i think in terms of craziness <laughs> of what's been happening i guess uh, one thing that i wanted to ask you about and this was also brought up in chat uh for people who've watched me like i've heard of dwarf fortress but i haven't really been able to get into it partly has been the ui i know this has been something that I'm sure you have heard of, I'm sure the chat has gone through many, many times. And well, I just wanted to ask, in terms of like UI as our like working with the Steam version, like what have you been doing or like have you had like people from like Kid Fox or like what kind of work has been done like on the UI front for Dwarf Fortress? Yeah, I mean we've known the problems, right? It's just mm -hmm. we haven't addressed them. Um sometimes they're just difficult to address because it's a text graphics game, mm -hmm. uh, which limits your options, but that's not really an excuse because people have done better jobs than us for sure. There's a lot of great ones now. Um, and uh, the part of it's just been our focus, which is, you know, um, not in inexcusable basically. Uh, but now we're working on it uh, more or less full time. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we, we are able to make more consistent control schemes. We're able to add mouse support which is huge. And we're able to add uh, graphics to the game, which is, um, you know, just a huge stumbling block for a lot of people just literally cannot play games that have text graphics. It's just not possible for them. And uh, so that's um, just, just kind of the baseline is a good starting point. And of course we've played tons of strategy games and um, settlement management games and you know, people take tips from each other's UIs all the time. Uh, and, uh, so we're, we're not starting from scratch, uh, for sure, uh, that, uh, you know, people have had a lot of good ideas and, uh, uh, about how control schemes should work and we'll just be, we'll be how the user flow should work, that kind of thing. Workflow is getting those key presses down, getting things, you know, placed in nice locations. Don't have to move your mouse that much and get the forward, the good information and hide the bad. Etc. Not that I know anything about anything, as I said before. 
as it regards this thing. But I mean, you could develop, I mean, playing and thinking and writing about games, you do develop a bit of, um, you know, intuition about this kind of thing. And hopefully that will uh, serve us well. And it's, it's um, fortunate to have the, the people that we do have, the artists, I definitely should give a big old shout out to the artists who are also kind of play, play testing the game and coming up with uh, user interface ideas, right? This is, it's a, it's kind of a, a, a benefit of having experience, like a deeply 10 year type experience modders um, uh, that know a lot of facets of the game better than I do, um, uh, that can, uh, um, you know, give, give uh, good feedback and, and ideas about how things should be. Um, and we're doing a good job. It's going to be cool. I think uh, uh, people uh, will not have the same difficulties that they had uh, trying to get into the, the text version, uh, the things that, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we've collected, you know, quite a list of things that have specific things that have caused people to bounce off the game, right? And um, we will uh, be alleviating those systematically. Um, and uh, there'll be a whole new set of <laughs> reasons that people bounce off Dwarf Fortress and we'll just have to keep working on it. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's going to be easier to play than it is now. For sure. Okay. And to speak about the modders and mods in general, the chat has brought up a few lists of mods earlier in it. I guess uh, for yourself and Zag, are there any particular mods or mod collections that you really enjoy or you really love to see in the game? Oh, I mean, we have enough trouble playing the game vanilla to actually <laughs> have time. I mean, yeah, we just haven't had time to really... Uh, the, the, the time I see mods, interestingly... Uh, uh, is when I'm debugging saves, uh, like it's like get a crash save in or something, and all of the dwarves in the fortress are sort of dragging people with wings. <laughs> it's just like, oh, cool! It's it's called like Dragon People Fortress or whatever because it'll actually change the name of the game uh, based on the 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 type of creature that you're playing. Just thought that would be funny, and there it is. But uh, um, yeah, so so it's, I mean we so I don't have I don't have specific tips. Of course, there has to be like a shout out for like the lazy noob pack and people that had trouble getting into the game. If you just download it off our site, uh, you could try the the lazy noob pack. Um, has a bunch of mods and things bundled in to uh, help people out to the extent that that it's possible to get into the current version. That it certainly helps a lot of people. Um, and um, we'll also be thinking about a lot of that a lot of that stuff. Uh, when we're doing the Steam version, uh, ways that, that people can be helped out. Um, but yeah, I didn't have anything uh, specific to shout out uh, other than that. Okay. And I guess uh, one thing that I was kind of curious about, with the Steam version, obviously in development, you guys are still offering the free version. When the Steam version is released, are you still going to allow people to play the free version? Will it still be available? Or will like, how will things, I guess, shift, if anything? So what we decided to do, um, because the game has been, you know, free for so long, we have a kind of devoted fan base, and not all of them want to or are capable of of getting it at the, uh, you know, the places that we'll be putting it up, uh, Steam and Itch at first. Um, we're going to continue releasing the free version with a feature, what is it? Feature parody is that what it's called? Um, aside from the the graphics and music, of course, uh, but a lot of the new interface knickknacks are going into the, the free version as well, and that's called DF Classic now. Classic, <laughs> the classic version of Dwarf Fortress. It's almost old enough to be a classical artifact, and uh, we'll we'll just keep releasing it. Um, it's going to be released on the um, the web page as usual, and for people that do get the the version on Steam, um, and I and I suppose itch too, although I know less about how that works because we haven't been using that for, for testing pipeline. Uh, but uh, the, there's this whole thing where you can create branches and, and stuff like that. And the, uh, so the free one should be available there as well uh, if you just want to continue using that version. Um, it should just be something where you can like click two buttons and then you're on, you're on text mode for, um, you know, and it's, it's also possible to incorporate text mode into the graphics one internally and just kind of switch between them. I haven't done that yet. I know Jupiter Hell does that, which is interesting. Um, that's one of the, uh, the roguelike that kind of came out of the, the Doom roguelike scene, but um, it, 
seen, meaning, you know, the person that works on it or the, the group of people that work on it. I, I suppose there's more than one though. Um, and uh, the, um, that, that, that's cool because it has kind of this sort of almost real time, pseudo real time uh, look to it with the animations and so forth. But you can also just press a button and then pop, you're on a grid and everything's the same. Uh, the, there's no mechanical change. But um, that, 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 that is interesting in principle when you can pull it off and we, we could, could theoretically do the same thing. All right. I think with that, I have one final question I want to ask you about, and then I think we will wrap things up for tonight. And I guess this is kind of like a summation of what we've been talking about. Like in the last about almost an hour and 30 minutes, we've spoken a lot about kind of the ins and outs of Dwarf Fortress, ins and outs of or at least a little bit on proc gen as well. And uh, one thing that I've seen, again, like, as we talked earlier about kind of the influence and legacy of Dwarf Fortress, is we've seen other developers try to go along the lines of Colony Sim. I've heard the term, you know, Dwarf Fortress-like use as well in some circles. And one of the things I definitely want to ask you, again, with so much time that you've spent on this game, for developers watching this who are thinking about doing a colony sim of any, you know, scope on their own, what has been, if any, like, any kind of, like, design traps or red flags you can offer them? Like, if they want to try and build a colony sim on their own, you know, something for them to avoid when they're trying to build theirs. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the typical warnings apply, of course. Like, you can both under plan and over plan a project and you should not think of your, I mean, the, 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 the sort of settlement management games like this uh, do tend to inspire people to come up with a lot of ideas because it's a pretty open, you know, it's a, it's, it's a settlement. It involves more than one person. You can do all kinds of things. Oh, hey, scamps. You can do all kinds of things with, uh, with that. And uh, the, the, uh, so you could definitely over plan and that's, that gets to be, that gets to, that's like the biggest, the biggest kind of roadblocks you can get into uh, with it. Um, but then like once you, once you, so you want to get a game loop up and running as quickly as possible. You have your little, your little critters, whatever they are. Um, if, if you have little critters running around or if you have your, your buildings and things or thinking about that, that paradigm, then, uh yeah are there are there i mean you yeah i mean again it comes to over planning i'm just trying to think of people that i've thinking about in the past that have kind of screwed it up um trying to add too much to the characters at first uh yeah no it's it's um yeah just keep it simple because it will not stay simple <laughs> that will happen that will happen on its own uh so um yeah, certainly. I mean, it's not it's not great advice. I'd have to I'd have to think a, a little bit, a little bit more to get into specific pitfalls because I'm sure I'm sure there are some that are more specific to the genre. I mean, I I like to think about, uh, of course, from my perspective, they're they're sort of emergent narrative games, and so it's uh, important to think about the kind of the kind of what what about your game is actually creating the stories and what is the player? What are they doing? I think that's that's maybe something that people people don't think about as much as they should. So you certainly think about in advance, you know, what is the player and have kind of guiding principles about what the player can and cannot do. Because um, a certain amount of emergent narrative comes out of respecting the uh, autonomy of your agents or whatever, like little critters running around doing their thing. And that's going to have a huge impact on what it means uh in terms of player action like like what jobs you can set if there are jobs or what buildings you can place i mean i think there are some colony management type games now where they they place their own buildings they make their own roads that kind of thing um and it's certainly not something that happens in, in dwarf fortress among the dwarves um that you're playing so uh <laughs> that that and it's in, it's easy to get into a sort of um uh to th to make a game inconsistent when you're not thinking about what, what the player actually is doing or who they are or whatever, if they are anybody. Um, and then you'll, you'll compound your errors and end up in a, you know, with some huge kind of obstacles to overcome once you 
box yourself in the corner. But, right. And again, like, there are still, like, probably a few dozen more questions. We, again, we could probably just sit here all day and night and go over uh, <laughs> Proc Chen, uh, Proc Gen cat related questions as well. I'm sure the, yep. the chat will get into. <laughs> but one question came in that I think is too good not to ask. Uh, Pony asked in chat if you were a dwarf in your own game, what kind of dwarf would you be? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I guess the water pe- the water computer people would turn me into a, a mechanic or a or a vampire that just walks back and forth <laughs> on the same pressure plate. Um, so, yes, I can aspire to be more than a vampire stuck on a patrol route in a water computer, but <laughs> maybe that's what I am for the next year or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, for you then... Um, to end this cast on, do you have any final thoughts or anything you would like to say to the fans uh, to uh, tie a ribbon on here? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, no, 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 no final, final, no, 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 no particular thoughts. I've been spilling them out at random and that's all I can do now. So, uh, yeah, maybe I should hold my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, thanks for playing everybody. That's cool. Uh, and uh yeah hope you're looking forward to the new one um and uh yeah if you want to write a computer game um uh, it's fun although it's a yeah risky profession too there's a lot of computer games now mm-hmm. and i'm surprised nobody made a, a cat got your tongue joke in chat i guess that will be my <laughs> contribution to the cat related <laughs> puns and jokes there everyone <laughs> yeah, i hope he doesn't get my tongue you're gonna cause trouble cause some trouble all right. Well, with that, uh, we are going to wrap things up for this design cast. For my regulars or new people watching this live, uh, I will be back for my regular game stream later tonight. If you are a developer working on a game or want to talk design, we are always looking for guests for these live and recorded shows. Again, be sure to check out War Fortress, either the classic or free version or the Steam version. There will be links to them or to the respective pages in the description down below for the recorded. And, as always, be sure to join our Game Wisdom Discord channel, where we hang out, talk design, and rant about all manner of topics. <laughs> that is open to everybody. So again, Torn, thank you so much for coming on. Best of luck with the Steam release, and I hope uh, things uh, turn out well for you and Zach. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me on. All right. So for that, with that said, everybody, as always, come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where some of the are in science of games. Until next time, take care. <laughs>